Please be seated, everyone. Okay, Ms. Hughes, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Agent, you just, um, prior to our lunch break, you summarized a, a part of your interview with the defendant where you indicated to him for the first time that this was a homicide, is that correct? Yes. And was a clip of that part portion of your interview on the, um, on the disc that you gave me prior to your testimony? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask to be able, allowed to publish clip two on state's exhibit number 113. Go ahead. And we're looking at all that electronic data 
they did what they wanted out there, which is to visit the target. And that's what we do. Our job is to have animals sift through all that, to talk to people, right? And and what I see is, is I see a lot of perfect storm elements that are that are circling around the top, a lot of pressures that are weighing in on you. We had that first that first affair about five years ago. What did you know about that? I don't absolutely know about that time. We know about well, I mean like so we, I know about that first affair. I know how hard that hits you mm -hmm. and the family. I know what that did to your trust. I mean, I know that, that shattered trust. And I know that that wasn't a, a one and done, that things just were, you know, left behind after a few counseling sessions. I know the baggage from that labor, both in her life and in your life, such that mm -hmm. your relationship was never the same. Um, and there was a lack of, of trust and there was a level of suspicion, rightfully so, Todd, because you're right. Um, as you start to have your children, I know your children are very, very important to you. I know Tristan and, and Taylor and Wyatt are very important to you. And, and I know you work really hard at your farm and you've got to really, you've got to, I mean, and it's something that you want to pass on to your children. I get that it's farming has come down to generations. Yeah, but I didn't even have this farm. And I know a little bit all that's there. And you're trying to be a good dad in the midst of Amy not really pulling weight in some ways, right? I mean, that, that'd be putting it nicely to say that she's out having sex with another man that time. That's a devastating thing. Yeah, that's right. And that's a, that's right. a, that's a, that's a devastating thing. That's, that's a devastating storm on the horizon. But then to have this, again, in 2018, you say, oh, man, not again. Not again. Jerry, again. And you have suspicions. And you're right to have suspicions. And you're worried about things going on between the two of them. And there was the confrontation you had with Jerry. He actually went out and confronted Jerry's wife, and he called her and we were talking to her on a couple occasions. Remember the conversations with, with Amy. Remember all these things going on. And Todd, you were feeling the, the, the stress of a lot of things in your life at this point. And that lack of trust was, was gone away. Here you are trying to, to put in our yards, work the farm, do the right thing, cultivate that, cultivate that relationship with your kids. Tristan is coming up. He is, he is a young version of you, right? He is. He must want to be proud You should be very proud of him. And you want to hold this family together, you told me, so bad. But that's not chief on Amy's mind. It is on some days. But Amy is... I don't know what, I don't, I don't know what she was thinking every day. Amy needs taking care of Amy's needs. I don't know what she was thinking. I've been asked her so many times. I mean, but she thought it was all this moment stuff. And she's chasing after Jerry and pursuing that relationship even after. She's not worried about you. In fact, her conversations are, what portion of the farm would she get if she left you? And what would happen with the kids? Could she walk out clean? Could she walk out clean with some of your farm? Could she take some of that away from you? I knew that was going on. And you thought about those things. You were worried and contemplating what she could do if she tried to rip that away from you. And so all these perfect storm elements that you could have been bringing to the table. Yeah, yeah. And this is all still very much fresh. Yeah, yeah. 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 Nice day out the, the hog barn and doing some chores. Things got out of hand. I know they did. I know for a fact now we can look at that and we can see the evidence. And here's the deal with this time. The evidence will drive this thing. It will drive it. The evidence will tell the story of what happened. It'll tell the, the who, the what, the when, the where. But what that evidence is, it's, it's cold, it's indifferent. So when that evidence is laid out, and it tells what happened. That's cool. But explanation, what you and I are doing here, that's warm. When people can understand the perfect storm and the things that were going on with, and the stressors you were under and what Amy was, was putting you through and the other things that were going on, that's warm. People can understand my mind that you were not trying to think of, right? You know, you knew all that time. Uh, listen, I think this will come to an end. I think you were you knew about the, the relationship and you had your suspicions and it was not at you and you were upset. You weren't going to have that farm taken away from you by Amy. That wasn't going to happen. You weren't going to have your children taken away from you by Amy. You weren't going to be jerked around 
for round number two, after you, you weathered the storm five years ago, you went to the counseling, you did the right thing, and here we are. We're right back after commitments are made, and you allow her to try and rebuild trust, and here we are in the summer of 2018. Here we are right now, and Amy's doing it to doubt again. And now it's not just she's playing with, with you and your emotions and, and all the things that go with being a man when a woman does it to you. It's, it's all the other things, Todd. And I know, I know that was weighing very heavy on you and there was a lot of things going on inside of it. And the evidence shows all that. That's how that's, that's done. In some of these cases, there's a great mystery as to why things happen. But here, the, 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 what's been, the what's been determined, right? We know the body, the science is spoken. There's only one explanation for what happened. Now, there's only one explanation for what happened here. There's only one explanation. And there'll be only one explanation given. And that'll be hard and fast. But it will be cold. And people will be looking for the why. And they'll want to say, God, help us with the why. And I'm sitting here today, and I know the why. I know why you got to this point. I know why you got to, to this point, Todd. I know. I know what happened that Saturday. And I know why you got to the point where you were so and God, sometimes we do things for, we do bad things, and we try to protect the ones we love, we try to protect our children, we try to protect those closest to us, and we do things that are not good things, and we do things that we wouldn't normally do. I know that. I know that, God. And I know there was a, there was a family, I can tell you, I've been a, I've been a police officer a long time, I've been doing 18 years, so. And I remember, a, I remember a father, much like yourself, a good father, who lived down in southern Iowa, and then take his family up to Minnesota to fish in a cabin. And he had to work Friday. He had a tough job, and he worked, but he told his wife, I'm going to get out early, I'm going to pick you and the kids up, have the vehicle loaded, we're going north, we're going to be on the water by morning. I'm going to get you up to Minnesota. And they started this trip, and he, he, he works really early, goes in Friday early. He's exhausted, trying to be a good dad. Gets home late. Life's kind of frazzled, right? But he's doing the right thing. His wife has three kids loaded up. They had three kids. And, and he jumps out of his work vehicle into, his, into their SUV, and they start north. It's already night. He's already later than he wanted to get there. He has, he's got a long drive up north, long drive. So then I up into, way up into Minnesota. He starts to drive. And makes food for the kids. I remember this well. And they get rolling. And you know what happens. You get kids with a full belly. You get, everybody eats. Nighttime, you're driving. What starts to happen? Everybody starts nodding off. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. including good mm-hmm. dad. He's trying to, you know, man the ship, right? So he's just trying to get everybody up to vacation on time, be a good dad, keep his kids happy. He made promises to them. And it's nighttime, and he looks around. Everybody's sleeping. Wife's out, right? They're back there. And if you remember, they tell us not to do this, but two of the kids were sitting normal. One of them laid across the. Remember how you used to do that, right? You just kind of laid out there. One of the third child laid out on the boys laid across the laps of the other two in this SUV on, on the back row. And Dan starts getting tired, Todd. Huh? Dan starts getting tired. And pretty soon it's struggle strips and we've been there. And then you, 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 work, you wake up a little bit. Yeah. Right? And the gentleman spikes me on the table. Mm-hmm. And he's like, man, I gotta, man, I gotta stay on. I can't do this, right? I gotta hold it together for my family. And finally he's by the Snook River. I think from around 35 is Snook River. There's a river there. Pretty good size. Not, not really, I guess. Okay, it looks like good says it's called the Snook River. And he, he ends up drifting off and then hits that left side, right? He goes over, hits the rumbles, but he actually hit, hits that guardrail, which brings him to, jerks the vehicle back hard to the right, right? He's on the interstate, he's on 35, ramps it back, brings it all the way over, comes over and, and hits this side a little bit, and then brings it to a stop. Then we get control of him. Gets out, what sounds like him. Not nearly as bad as I thought it was, right? Step things up a little bit, not bad, getting back in. Everything else. I think I'm okay. Starts rolling again, right? Just tries to keep moving. Pretty soon his wife's coming too. She's getting pretty hysterical. She's looking in back and she's screaming at him. And he's like, what, what, honey, wasn't that bad? And he pulls the vehicle over and he sees what happened. And he went left and then he drifted right. He catapulted that, that sun right out the window. Uh, straight to the window, right over the river, goes down in that river. And they stop, and he calls 911, and everybody's down there. 45 minutes later, they retrieve the body, but it's too late. Little boy's dead. What's that now? Tons of, tons of division and, and hardship in this marriage, right? Wife is mad at him. What are you doing? You know, 
she needed to find herself for all somebody loves and all the things I can. I wish I could, if I could do this over again, if I could, if I could just have a do-over on this, there's, there's so many things that need differently, right? I'm trying to be a good dad. I'm trying to do the right thing. If I could just do things over, right? And God, I know, I know, I know when I look at this situation and I look at what the evidence says and I look at how angry he's killed and what happened and I look at that perfect storm that swirled around this time and I know what was going on in your life and I can see that so clear. I can see every time, I can see your involvement in this and everything. It all says one thing, but the one thing it doesn't show the why, but I see the why. Now we talk for, for a while time and I know the why. Because Todd's getting, Todd's getting hurt bad here. And Todd's trying to hold the family together like you told me. You're trying to do what's right family with everything out of your family. Your family is everything. Todd, your family is everything. Your family is everything, Todd. But it's sometimes we all need years. Todd, all I've ever said. Todd, all I've ever said about what my family is doing. I want my family to die. That's all I've said. My family, my kids, it means everything to me. Todd, it's all I've ever said. I want my family to die. That's all I've said. My family, my kids, it means everything to me. Todd. They do. I love my kids. I, I love my kids so much. And I, I do. And God, sometimes, sometimes people, we do things for those we love. We do bad things. But we do things because we try to protect the ones we love. And I know that here. I know you're trying to protect your family. And all of together, even if Amy is doing things to rip that family apart, I know that you're trying to hold this together. And you were trying to do the right thing. God, I remember, I remember, I remember when I came home one night, I came home from work, my neighbor is pissed off. He comes across the street, he's mad as hell. He comes across the street and says, come look at this. You come look at my truck. Takes me over, shows me his truck, truck, big key mark right down the side, a rock mark, whatever, right? And I said, that's too bad, man. He's like, no, it's too bad because you're worse than one that did it. There's no chance, man. What would do that? Raise me better than that, right? He goes, no, I said, no way, man. And uh, I said, here, I'm going to get him right now. So he's like, I'm going to go, oh, this is my truck. Get him out. I didn't want to go, hey, I'm going to say, get him out. I'm sorry, I'm so glad. I'm going to I'm sorry, man. I have no idea. I have no idea. And I, I leave my kid in this room for hours, right? Finally, my wife's like, hey, you think you should talk to me? Well, I know what's going on. It doesn't come back to me, right? Keep me in his truck. It turns out that my wife gets the bottom. What I find out, after I'm so red, I can't, I'm not even thinking straight, right? What I find out is, my son had been over on the neighbor's house, and the neighbor said something bad about me, right? It made a derogatory comment about me. Mm -hmm. So my son, and that guy goes inside, and he does, and takes, takes the rock, runs it right down, I guess, to defend my honor, right? To defend my honor, okay? Mm -hmm. And so now when I find out, later, I wasn't interested up front, right? All I saw was, this is what happened, right? That, that I'm looking at the truck, problem, you did it, don't do it. Now I understand. Now I understand when, when my boy does something for me, right? It's wrong, but he did something for me. He was, he was trying to protect me. He was trying to defend my honor. And Todd, I know sometimes we do things for people that we care about. And we try to protect them, but here's the problem, Todd, here's the problem. As, you, as this happens, and as this happens, you want to hold the family together. And this thing happened, and you did not see this coming on this day. There was a lot of perfect strong things going on in your life, God. The evidence shows us that. And things were swirling, but things came to a head on Saturday. And then things happened, and I know you weren't trying to, you weren't working this up for, for weeks and weeks and weeks and a long time. You were going to kill me like this time. But I know things came to a head, and I know about, I know about what happened that morning. And this happens, and God, then things just, things got out of hand. Saturday morning, things got out of hand for you. And then it's, oh my God, my family, which means more to me than anything. My family, which means more to me than anything. This is not going to happen like this. I'm not going to let it happen. So, Todd, I know sometimes we do things because we're trying to protect the ones we love. We're trying to protect Tristan. We're trying to protect Taylor in this. We're trying to protect life. We're still, even in this, trying to hold that family together. And Todd, here's what happens when you can't bottom that and say, I don't know, man, I didn't have anything to do with it. And we think we're protecting people. At this point, we're not protecting anybody. In fact, now you're the only one hanging out there that's saying, I didn't have anything to do with it, death. I didn't know anything that happened Saturday. It's a big mystery to me, in fact. The case back shows Todd absolutely 100% that's not the case. I know that now. It's done. 
time you were there. So you need to see anything, then you, you were there. You were there. I wasn't the one that was there. Anyone. You're the one who was there. What was going on in your head, Don, when this happened? Because the explanation is going to need to be given for this night. You don't want the evidence to drive this thing home. It's going to be cold. And people are going to be wondering, man, how did Don get to that point? How did Don, how did this happen? Because when you had to have this, it's one that I know it wasn't, it wasn't something you were talking about. I know that when you do this thing, and Don, I look at, I look at something like this, and I say, Don, don't, don't force those closest to you. Don't make trust in Try and bury this thing with you. Trust in those big things were right there. Who knows? Who knows? You guys weren't together that morning. There was, there was time when, when you and Tristan were not together that morning. I know that now. But you know, and I do. Time is done. It's done, time. Yeah. So we're done. So that, we can't, we're not, I didn't, I didn't come in here today to debate if this happened. I came to sit down and talk to you about the why at this point. And it's really important. It's really important. There's two guys sitting here. And I just want to hear from you, Todd. Is this something where you're sorry that things got to this point? Or don't you even care? He's going to walk you soon. Or, or do you, as you sit here, a few minutes ago, almost in tears, you're telling me how important your family is. I believe that. I believe you. Well, he started talking about my, he started talking about five years ago. Yeah. My emotions come back. I'm, Absolutely, they come back. That was my goal. That's why I did what I did. I, 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 no, I, mean, I mean, as far as making the right, here's a recommit. You're recommitted. That's, that's why I did that. Here's another scene. You had sex with another man in 2008. I didn't. I didn't know Yeah, Todd. You were so mad about that. And you felt betrayed again. And you saw there's no facts. Yeah, Todd. And you knew. You knew what was happening. And there was no way, there was no way I said that you were going to let things go down this way. She was not going to take all that from you. Not cheating on you twice, and then taking you, trying to take your kids, and then trying to take the farm. That wasn't happening. You weren't going to let that happen. And I understand that. I mean, I mean, are you sorry that something like this got to this point, or do you not care at all? Just something you just, well, you just don't care. Are you just going to tell me to And I know that's not you, but I said you're with you. I know God, I know you, I know you care about Amy. I know you love Amy. This is not a situation I, I love with all my heart. Yeah, you do. And that's how things happen like this. You don't hurt Amy because you don't love her. You hurt her because you love her too much. You hurt, you hurt her because you love her so much and she doesn't return that love. In fact, she betrays you. And that's why this happens. It's not that you don't love Amy. It's because you love her more than she ever loved you. And you know that's true. And I know that's true now. And I know you're sorry that this happened. I know as we sit here, you're so sorry this happened. And I know as we sit here that God, this is weighing heavy on you. It doesn't, it doesn't go away. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't move on. So I'm not trusting you. So I'm not trusting you, Taylor and Wyatt. They need explanation. They're going to, they'll see what happened. And they're going to want to know. And they're going to need you to step up and be that dad that you told me that you are, Todd. You told me you're a good dad. I, mean, I believe that. I believe you're, you're a good father. I believe you're a good husband. Better than most. A lot of them would have been gone five years ago, Todd. You know that. Most would not have put up with round one. Definitely don't want to put up with round two. And they don't want to hear about pulling things out from underneath me. As you're being unfaithful, you're going to, you're going to do that to me, too. You're going to do that. So you're going to, you're going to dig a dagger into my heart, and then you're going to play with my kids and my farm? No man can handle that. I get that. I get it, Todd. So as we sit here, I, I know. I know this is the case of loving Andy too much. Too much. And I'm, I'm reaching out to Andy. I'm just, I'm guy enough. I know you're in a hole here. I know this is scary. It's hard. I know you're hurt. And I know you think, there's no way to talk to you. I want to be that guy for you, but I just want to talk to you. I just want to, I just want to hear from you. Tell me about how hard that was. I know it was hard. I know. I know the trajectory leading up to, to this and this. I know how we get here. We both know how you got there. And it was a spontaneous. This was not a, this was not a, 
a little pretty, a little pretty thing. This is, this is it. The perfect storm hit right here. Right here. Right here on that farm on Saturday. The perfect storm hit. And all those elements finally came in on and they converged. And Todd, it was more than you could bear. It was more than any man could bear. And I understand that. And people can understand that as we talk. What they can't understand is this coldness, lack of explanation, that, 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 that people don't understand. But they can understand when you and I talk, and they hear, and they hear about the emotion that you were feeling come Saturday. When we talk about how things came to a head that day, and Tom was done. Tom was done carrying the water, carrying the water, and carrying the water for a lot of years. Been carrying the water for a lot of years, Todd. Too many. And I know you, you want to do right by your kids. And the right thing at this point is to tell the truth. It's always good to tell the truth. You don't trust them that. Don't tell them that. You don't hide it. Telling the truth is always good. But now we can't just say that as a parent. You can't say that and walk away from this. You can't be that dad. You can't be that parent and tell them that lesson and then walk here. Sometimes we do bad things for the people we love when we try to protect them. That I understand. But we can't tell our children that the truth is the right thing to do and then walk away from a situation like this. We love them by living what we tell them, by living out what we we can't be. We can't be something other than what we tell our kids to be. That's not fair to them. They deserve better than that time. They need you to step up. They need you to be their dad. Even in this situation, they need you. They need you right now, in this moment. And I need you. God, are you sorry this happened? Or are you not sorry? Are you sorry that well, they, they must know everything already? I do. I do. God, we both do. You can tell me that. I didn't just tell you. I told you. And God, you know it. You know better than I do. Because I wasn't in that, I wasn't in that shed in that moment, was I? I'm just coming in and picking up the pieces afterwards. What we've done for 18 years, and then you tell me what happened. And I didn't know that. You know what? It's so mean. Things got so, so out of control. Things got so out of control for you that Saturday morning time. It was more than you there. You didn't plan it. It came to this point, and that was it. It made it to happen, but then things got out of control. And then it happened, and it was like, oh, man. Oh, man. And now I sit down, and, and you got to try and explain it. Your first thought is, take care of my family. Take care of this farm that I want to pass on to my family. Those are virtuous things, I get it. And you start to try and explain. But the problem is, God, that you weren't ready for this. You weren't ready for this moment. You were not ready for this moment, and you were not ready to try and not tell the truth when it happened. And that's when things start to, they all start to just come unglued. They came unglued right before this. They came unglued in this moment. And I know, I know what you can do with that. I know, I know you wish this wouldn't happen to you. I know it's not. I know that. I know that if you could do it, a do-over on Saturday, November 10th, you would pull this back. You would just do a few things different. You just walk out of that situation. You just don't talk to somebody. But that's not how it happened. On Saturday, things came to a head, and they happened the way they did. And now it's time to, and now it's time to, to be the dad that you, that you tell your kids who you are. And don't, don't let anybody else be right about you that's the same that you're something less right than that. I know you're a good dad. I know you were a good husband. This story still has more to write, Don. There's so much more to write here. But show yourself to be the guy that you told your children you were, that you've raised Tristan for 13 years. You've raised him to be you, which is what a good dad does. But you've got to write out the last, you've got to write these, these, these chapters that keep going in his life, and you've got to know that his dad was a stand-up guy. So that's what, when he did something, he did it to try and protect the family ultimately. And it wasn't the right thing that you're willing to say, okay, okay, son. Okay, son. He needs that. He needs that. He needs you to do that bad for him. And those around him, God, give him an explanation. God, you know, you want to get me to come down to something. Yeah, that's all I'm up to. Uh,
to that color. Touch sometimes will look bad things. It doesn't change how much we love people. It doesn't even change who we are. But we do have to step up and be honest. We do need to tell the truth. Because what's closest you don't want that explanation. And I want to be the one I want to understand today. I want to have that understanding that comes from you. Agent, after your interview with the defendant, what did you do? So following the interview, I executed the search warrant that you saw uh, Todd reading over. And what was that search warrant for? A number of things. It included uh, a buckle swab or a DNA sample, uh, photographs of his, his body and his major case prints, which is what we would call a full set of fingerprints. And when you took photographs of Todd's body, did that include his hands? Yes, and everything. His, and did it also include his upper body, including his face and his neck and chest area? Yes. And did you observe any injuries on Todd's body at that time? No. And uh, by the way, I know earlier you indicated that you also interviewed Jerry Frazier for approximately one and a half hours. Yes. And that was a couple days prior to the interview you had with Todd? Yes, it was. And when you sat with Jerry for an hour and a half, did you, make, uh, did you also look at his hands and his face and his chest and neck area? Yes. Jerry sat right next to me in my unmarked police car. I had an hour and a half, just a couple feet apart, and I was watching his hands and his face and couldn't see any injuries. Now, later that day after you executed those search warrants um, at the police station, did you then go to the Mullis farm? Yes, I did. And what was the purpose of going to the Mullis farm? There are a number of additional items on that search warrant, as you heard me reference in the recording, uh, some things that needed to be picked up that the judge had ordered us to do. And um, when you were at the Mullis farm, was the defendant there as well? Yes, he was. And did you have the opportunity to talk to the defendant again? Yes, I spoke to him in the driveway of the house. And did you talk to him again about some of the events that happened on November 10th, 2018? Yes, I did. And again, did you indicate to the defendant that this was a homicide? Yes, I and told him that, that it was a homicide. And did the defendant say anything? He did not. I told him, Todd, this was a homicide, and we just want justice for Amy. And did the defendant react to that? No. Did he say anything? No. At that point, did the defendant indicate anybody else that he thought could have done this? No, he did not tell me anyone else that could have done this. Now, uh, were you present on the day that the defendant was arrested? Yes, I was. And what date was that? February 28th of 2019. And did you have a conversation with the defendant on that date as well? Yes, I was there uh, for the sole uh, reason that I wanted to give him one more opportunity to try and tell the truth about what he'd done to Amy. And uh, at that time, was anybody else present for that conversation? Uh, there was the initial arrest, and then those officers had stepped away so I could talk to Todd one-on-one -on -one for a little bit. And at that time, what, what did you tell the defendant or say to the defendant? I told him this is exactly where, uh, when we'd talked several months prior that we would be, the evidence had shown that, in fact, he had killed Amy, and that's why I was here. And did the defendant say anything at that time? No. It's infringing on the defendant's Fifth Amendment rights, uh, this line of questioning. Well, um, specifically the question that's been asked is silence and his right to do so. Well, I'm going to allow this question. The last question was, did the defendant say anything? I'll let the witness answer that with a yes or a no. Go ahead. No, he did not. Now, Agent, at any point, or are you aware of fingernail clippings being completed by um, Amy, um, being completed and collected on Amy Mullis's body? Yes, I am. And uh, do you know how the, or who collects those? During an autopsy, the state medical examiner, as part of their protocol, will take fingernail clippings. They'll also take major case prints. Again, that's a full set of fingerprints from the deceased. We don't ask them to do that. That's just standard protocol during an autopsy. And in this case, did you ask that there be any analysis on those uh, fingernail clippings? No, I did not. Why not? Well, in fact, although those are taken at every autopsy, I can tell you having worked uh, dozens and dozens of death investigations and homicides, oftentimes we don't submit those. That would be driven by 
the facts of the case, whether or not we would actually do anything with those. And in what cases would you or would you ask for fingernail clippings to be an analyzed? Fingernail clippings from the state medical examiner could be potentially helpful if you're dealing with a, a whodunit, uh, some type of random attacker. But here, the evidence in this case over a, a, an extensive three and a half month investigation, the evidence as it kept coming in continued to only point to one suspect, that's the defendant killing Amy Mullis. This was not a whodunit. It wasn't a mystery attacker. Um, therefore, fingernail clippings would not be um, particularly helpful in a case like this. Um, so there's other reasons as well. Um, when we look at a case like this, the medical examiner actually does a full external examination of the body before they actually cut the body open and do the internal examination. Could we have a question and answer here? Go ahead, ask another question. Sure, Your Honor. Throughout your investigation, did you have an opportunity to actually view the medical examiner report? Yes, I did. And did you also speak with the medical examiner, Dr. Cruz, on different occasions? Yes, I did. And uh, d did that medical examiner report indicate anything about Amy's uh, nails, specifically fingernails? Yes, so in the part of the autopsy that's labeled the external uh, examination, the state medical examiner noted uh, that the nails were short and intact. There's no reference to chipping, breaking, uh, missing fingernails or any debris or anything that they noted under those nails that would draw attention to those and cause us to think that fingernail clippings would be of some value potentially. I have nothing further. Cross-examination. Sir, where did that interview take place that we watched? The Delaware County Sheriff's Office. And that was on November 16th, uh, six days after the death. Yes, that'd be on the Friday following the homicide. This interview process, I, I assume, how many years have you been an agent? Uh, about 19 years. And you've conducted how many in interrogations like this? Uh, dozens. Okay. And I, you, have you had training in questioning individuals, both witnesses, suspects, that kind of thing? Yes. Is there a methodology to, to how you were conducting this, invest, this uh, interview? There is a, a process we would follow in interviewing people as well as interrogating people, yes. Has that ever been referred to as the Reed method? Not the method that I'm utilizing, no. Okay. You indicated that Mr. Mullis uh, didn't deny things. Um, in my notes, um, you want me to confess to something I didn't do. Did you hear him say that? Yes. Isn't that a denial? I would call a denial, no, I didn't murder my wife. That'd be a denial is you want me to confess to something I didn't do. That's not an admission, is it? No. It's a denial. You can call it what you want. Okay. I would not call it a denial. And in, in here, it, if you look at the flow of things and listen to things, is it, is it part of the plan that you really don't give him a chance to answer your questions? You just roll right into something else? No. So that's not indicated, right? If you watch the two and a half hours, Todd has a tremendous uh, amount of opportunity to speak and does so. Earlier on in this interview process, the parts that we didn't see, is it, isn't it true that you told Todd that, that the state or your office had the ability to draw from the cloud conversations that were going on in the Mullis house the morning of the murder. I don't recall saying that exactly. Well, I'm going to read from page 126. Uh, um, conversations with you, um, other things going on, and Todd 
Would there be a reason as I'm listening back through Saturday morning that I would be hearing things on those cloud recorded conversations that are not, they are a little bit different than what we've talked about? Maybe that there was, there was some things going on that Saturday morning between the two of you. Between the two of you, there's uh, more than simp a little bit of emotion. Isn't that telling him that you were listening in on their breakfast conversation? No, in fact, if you look around the context of those comments, I am telling him there's a possibility in a situation like this that Amy may have been activating her phone or using her phone in such a way that the conversations between the two of them that morning were not private. They weren't just between the two of them. In fact, they may be recoverable electronically. So I asked him hypothetically, would there be any reason if I was to listen back on those that I would actually hear it wasn't a friendly morning, but in fact, other things were going on. Wouldn't it be a fair um, takeaway from this is that Todd never admitted or agreed, however you want to say that, that he was aware of, the, of this ongoing relationship between Amy and, and Jerry Frazier? Uh, so he certainly says that he's aware and confronts the two of them as you heard early on, he said that um, at some point he simply asks both of them and then he's satisfied with that. Okay. And he said that happened earlier in the summer, didn't he? He placed it in June of 2018. And you had already talked to Jerry Frazier about this, right? Yes, I had. I spoke to him two days before I spoke to the defendant. And he had told you that Todd had called him? Yes. And called his wife? Yes. And that Frazier had completely... Uh, denied that there was anything going on between him and Amy? Yes. And that Todd seemed satisfied with that? Uh, he hoped so. He was very scared that, that Todd would find out, but he believed that that had satisfied Todd for the time being. Did, he t did Frazier tell you that Todd had called back and apologized to both him and his wife for making that call? Um, I recall certainly uh, in talking to Christy that there's uh, maybe some kind of follow-up phone call. On several occasions, Todd, in fact, refers back to, well, that was five years ago, right? Um, I don't re recall specifically. But. Okay. I'm looking at a partial transcript here um, on page 137 when you were talking about uh, this perfect storm thing. Todd t starts to say, it just blows my mind that she was, and then you interrupted, well, Todd, you, and you said, uh, and then you continue on with some more questioning. So, again, isn't Todd denying that he was aware of an ongoing thing with her and Frazier? I'm not sure I'd get that from what you just read there, but. Okay. This fingernail clipping issue, um, you said, in response to a question from the state, uh, there was only one suspect examining or in looking into these fingernails wouldn't be helpful. I guess I don't understand that. Is there a question? I'm sorry. What, why, was, why was it not helpful or appropriate to, to look for anyone else? Well, we don't go hunting for other people. We go where the evidence takes us. And in this case, from the first day that I'm involved, the evidence points towards the defendant killing Amy. There's the possibility of Jerry Frazier, right? He's a person of interest very early on. And beyond that, there's no evidence in this case file that would indicate anyone else was on that property. There's no physical evidence. There's no interview evidence. So there is no need to, to be looking anywhere else. We're trying, we're open to all those possibilities, but we have to go where the evidence takes us. That's the only place where we can go. Okay. You knew, you knew that Tristan had said that Todd was in the barn with him the whole time, right? He said that during his, his initial interview with law enforcement. Okay. Several times he gave statements to that effect. I'm, I'm aware of the, the one with Special Agent Scott Rieger with the DCI and the, what we would call the, the lengthy or the, the interview that he did. Wouldn't that alone indicate that there could be someone else involved in this? If Tristan, was telling the, if Tristan was telling the truth, right? So you only investigate things when you think they're telling the truth? 
Absolutely not. Well, let's, let's talk about what happened to, to Amy Mullis. She appears to have had a horrible beating. Wouldn't you agree? There's other injuries on the, on the front side of her body. She's found face down with a corn rake in her back, and those are the fatal blows. And the medical examiner yesterday told us that she had defensive type wounds on her hands. I didn't hear the medical examiner's testimony, but I know there's other injuries on her body. So if, if she's getting attacked and she's trying to defend herself and she's getting w w defensive wounds to her hands, couldn't she be, couldn't those fingernails have something to do with it or show us some evidence? Again, the evidence in this case only shows two suspects. We don't have any other information that puts anyone else on that property. So when, when you make, when you decide this, this is the guy, you, that's, there, there's no more looking around. No, in fact, this is a three and a half month investigation. It's, you know, 40 plus interviews, 19 search warrants. We're of course always open to follow the evidence. That's what we're trained to do. And the evidence, as that investigation continues, always comes back to one person and one person only, and that's the defendant. All I'm asking, sir, is could those fingernail clippings have led to some other part or more investigation? Sure. Okay. Sir, uh, and I, I know you touched on this, and, and if I wasn't paying close enough attention, I apologize. At the end of the interview, you said we're going to take fingerprints and photograph mug shots and and uh, in a full body photo array is that correct something to that effect yes okay and that included mr. Mullis being uh, stripped down to just his underwear and his whole body being photographed from different angles is that correct yes close-ups of his hands and his feet and his face yes all right similar to uh, things that we have been, it's been produced by the state. I don't know exactly what you've got there, what's been produced, but I did provide all the photographs. But no indication of any injuries? I didn't see any injuries uh, on his body. Okay. Thank you, then. That's all I have. Any redirect? Just, just briefly. Um, Agent Turbot, this happened in November, correct? Yes, November 10th. And do you know what the weather was like that day? I don't recall. No, you indicated, or counsel just asked you that the defendant didn't have any injuries that, that you saw during the, those, um, the execution of those search warrants. That's right. I don't recall any injuries. And uh, he also asked you about the fingernail clippings. Was there any evident, evidence of any injury at or around Amy's fingernails? No. Now, um, the defense attorney also asked you about the read method of interrogation. Are you familiar with that? I am. And what, uh, do you have extensive training in interrogation? I do. And uh, can you just briefly explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what that training is? I am at one point in my career early on. I've, I've been through the read training. That's a um, fairly, fairly standard interview and interrogation training technique. It's a nine-step process uh, that's taught to some police officers. And what... Um, interrogation technique did you use in this interview? So we actually, uh, inside of the DCI, and I'm actually part of a, a research and training group, there's, there's other methodologies that have evolved out of uh, more recent research. Sir, I believe in the response to one of the redirect questions, you said that there was no injuries to her hand. Objection, Your Honor. That was not the question. Well, I'm going to let him answer. Go ahead, if you remember. I believe the question was specific to uh, the fingernail area on the hands, and I did not recall any injuries. What I read on the autopsy report is the uh, fingernails were short and intact, and there was no note of any damage to the fingernail areas. You looked at uh, states exhibits 41, 42, 47, and 48. Not that I recall right now. May I approach you? Yes. Would you please 
please state the, the exhibit number and, and describe what, what you're seeing? 41 is the right hand of the victim. There's some, you know, generically I would say there's some, some bruising on, uh, it looks like something, there's purplish maybe bruising on some knuckles and there's a dark spot on the back of the right hand. Forty-two is the front side of the right hand. You can see some, looks like a cut maybe down near the, the base of the hand. A little hard to tell over on the wrist. Forty-eight would be again the right hand. You can see the, the top or the back side of the right hand. Again, some purplish, uh, maybe bruising or marks in a, in a small cut, maybe a cut up on the pointer finger knuckle. 47 is again a different angle of the victim's right hand. You can see some abrasions, uh, maybe an abrasion on, again, that right pointer finger. Uh, down at the knuckles, you see some purplish discoloration, a small cut, a dark spot on the back of the right hand. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. You can step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Any other witnesses for the state? Not at this time, Your Honor. The state would rest. Okay, very good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the state has presented their evidence. We're going to take a short break and talk about uh, defense witnesses. I'm going to give you about 15 minutes. Uh, remember the admonition I gave you before. Report back to the jury room. Okay, the record should reflect that we are outside the presence of the jury. We are still in the courtroom with the defendant and the attorneys. The state has just rested. Do we have any motions that we need to take up before we start with the defendant's case in chief? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead, Mr. Firehelm. Your Honor, at this time, the defendant would make a motion for judgment of acquittal and dismissal of the charges. Um, and in support of that motion, I would state to the court, uh, the elements of this offense of murder in the first degree is that Todd committed an act on Amy, that Amy died as a result of that act, and that he acted with malice aforethought, and also that it was a willful, deliberate, and premeditated with specific intent to kill. What the state has proven here, Your Honor, is that Amy died and she died, obviously, as a result of criminal behavior. What the state has not shown is the evidence that Todd committed this act and that caused Amy's death. Even when viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, no evidence has been produced that Todd was the person who attacked Amy. Their witness, Tristan Mullis, establishes that Todd could not have done this crime. They were together the whole time, only out of sight twice to get two drinks of water. I understand that there was a change in his testimony about a minute and 45 seconds to, I don't recall what the time was, but I believe that we have a time marker here in that his testimony established that he took two drinks of water from a hose in the office area of the, of the uh, hog barn and then returned to the barn where he again saw his father working on the uh, hog pens. Again, even viewing the evidence in a light most, most favorable to the state, to imagine that Mr. Mullis, because ex let me back up, Tristan also said he did not come out through the office area and out, out that side door that was shown in the photographs that were introduced. So the only other option would have been to travel either 
walk, jog, or sprint to the way uh, back end of the hog barn, out a door, up along and side of that long building, which has been described as a football field, approximately, go into the shed, attack Amy, beat her up, and kill her with this corn fork, and then return to the barn without any signs of dishevelment, injury, excitement, uh, lack of breath, appearing to per perfectly normal to Tristan when he came back in the barn from these two drinks of water. The other evidence that the state has presented as to uh, statements that Amy had made to others that have been shared, uh, are, are they in themselves are not consistent, such as her uh, frantic calls to people uh, at the hospital Deborah Sherbring, I believe, I may be saying that wrong, um, when she heard from her friend uh, Terry that there were rumors again. Uh, and I believe that uh, Patricia Christofferson said that, I believe the next day, that she was contacting her in a, in a uh, very normal fashion. But again, the statements being made by Amy Mullis at these times to these different people are being made while she's engaged in an extramarital affair. She's unhappy, she says, with her marriage, even though she disguises that in her relationship with Todd. So that these statements, uh, again, I realize you have to take them at face value, are still suspect. There's no evidence by internet or by statements or hearsay from Amy conveyed to other people that there was any conflict from the end of August when this rumor thing occurred, which Todd and Amy talked about, that there was nothing there uh, of conflict from then until her death. Jerry Frazier continued to be a farm manager no animosity or trouble between he and Todd, even though they had frequent contact. No issues between Amy and Todd. And in fact, the only thing that occurred during that time period was apparently uh, sometime around the middle of October when uh, Todd's mother chastised Amy for the amount of time that she was spending in, in uh, Des Moines, I believe, because of an uncle's health issue. Todd had shared by text messages that we saw with her friends, uh, Terry Stainer uh, mostly, that yes, it was bothering him that she was spending so much time away from home, um, that this was a, a tough time, that there was uh, field work and rainy weather and he had the kids and so forth. So, but th that's not the controversy that I think the state is trying to paint out here that would lead to this blow up where Todd would violently and viciously kill his wife and the mother of his children. So I would submit to the court that um, a, the granting of a motion or judgment of acquittal is appropriate at this time. Does the state want to respond? Uh, Your Honor, at this time the state would object to the court entering such a motion uh, as Rule 2.19 sub 8 of the Iowa Rules of Criminal Procedure states, the court on the motion of a defendant shall order the entry of judgment of acquittal if the evidence is insufficient to sustain a conviction of such offense or offenses. In this case, it is clear that the evidence is sufficient to sustain a conviction. Uh, in fact, when you take it in the light most favorable to the state, uh, when it's uncontroverted, or, I'm sorry, uncontroverted, uh, it is way beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, there are four elements to the marshalling instruction, and they were set forth by defense counsel. Uh, the state has cleared each and every one of those. And as far as Tristan's statements go, they were totally mischaracterized by defense counsel. Tristan said that he was out of his father's sight for two drinks. 
not the other way around. Tristan said he didn't know how long his father was out of his sight. Those are two wholly separate things. While it may seem like a subtle difference, it is a huge difference. Defendant was out of Tristan's sight for nobody knows how long. So he could have and did commit these crimes. The credibility of the witnesses are for the jury to decide. Um, the weight of the evidence is for the jury to decide. Uh, it has been admitted. What we know is defendant was on this farm. His family was on this farm. And no one else was on this farm. The murder occurred between uh, 1014 a.m. and 1201 p.m. He had planned this for almost a year. If you look at the Google searches, he was looking at potentially drowning. He was looking at potential firearm accidents. He was looking at potentially uh, starvation, dehydration, freezing to death, hunting accident, burning, and then bodily organs, which right before the stabbing or the impalement says a lot about this case and this man. This is clearly uh, a case that should go to the jury, uh, and the state has cleared uh, defendant's request for motion for judgment of acquittal, and it should be overruled. As counsel indicated, I have to take this motion in the light most favorable to the non-moving party. Weighing the evidence that we've had so far, there have been witnesses who have talked about uh, the defendant's statements, things to the effect of, um, I'm not going to give up half of what I've earned or accumulated. I'm not going to give up half the farm. Uh, we do have the internet searches on the device from the home. Um, we do have the defendant there at the scene in close proximity. And uh, in light of all of the testimony from all of the witnesses, including the statement that we watched uh, that the DCI agent took of the defendant, there certainly is evidence that the jury could use in this case to find that the state has met its burden of proof. The judgment, uh, the motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. Any other motions from the defense at this time? No, Your Honor. From the state? No, Your Honor. Okay. You all need a five-minute break or so before we start with the witness, but let's take a short break. <laughs> 